Morning, everybody. It's 11 o'clock. Um, so this week, there's not, not, not an awful lot of news. Obviously, we're um, bank holiday weekend week, so um, it's only a short one. Um, but we do have Andrew Hattie here, who's going to be looking at what happened over the course of August. And I'm going to be talking to Ed Simpson uh, from Gravis, who is going to be um, explaining a bit more about what's going on with the merger of GCP infrastructure and GCP asset-backed income. So, news first. So, the two things I picked out both happened this morning Harmony Energy Income and Triple Point Social Housing. Harmony first. Um, the discounts on renewables, they all widened out again in August, and these things are now, frankly, looking a bit ridiculous. Uh, Harmony's on a discount of 24% and a yield of nine, um, but most of these funds now are on a 20 plus discount, um, and yields are, you know, sort of seven eight nine just daft i think um it's obviously one of the three battery funds uh, and it's the newest one of these which is why it hasn't got as long a track record as the other two um and the smallest um i think it hoped that it would be able to be raising money uh fairly soonish but that's obviously not going to be possible at the moment um Really, the success of these all comes down to how fast they've been bringing their projects on stream, because when they do that, they get an NAV uplift. Um, Gresham House Energy Storage sort of hit the ground running and, and got off quite quickly. Gore Street's projects were smaller to start off with. It's, it's picked up the pace and it's catching up fast. Um, Harmony uh, is much newer to the pack, as I said, and so therefore it hasn't an awful lot operational yet, which I'll show you. And that's reflected in its NAV returns, but that's not a prediction of where they're going in the future. That's what the chart looks like. Um, so the NAV is sort of like climbing upwards, but we do have a drop here, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, and then another drop announced this morning. And obviously the discounts opened up um, first in October, which is not uncommon. A few of these funds did that. That's really when we started to see um, interest rates start to bite. Um, and then wider again, as I say, recently. Um, so this week, so today's NEV fall um, includes a mistake, in the calculation of the NEV, which is not something you ever really want to see. Uh, we had it with Next Energy not long ago. Um, in both of these cases, uh, maybe not as serious as it looks, but nevertheless, it's, it's not a welcome thing. The NEVs dropped down to 115 p ish um, and the valuation error uh, took about 3p off the, the actual NAV. But things under the underlying portfolio are going in the right direction, which is what I'm saying about these the previous thing on stream. Um, apart from one thing, which we'll talk about in a second there. Um, the valuation error um, relates to the valuation of short term cash flows. I'm not quite sure what that translates to in English. Um, in the Next Energy's case, it was all about accruing for VAT. Uh, I'm not sure it's the same thing. Um, it is an accounting error. Not a, there's no cash gone missing here or anything like that. Um, and it did mean that the NEV at the end of the last uh, financial reporting period, so end of October uh, 22, was overstated by 2p. So that's going to have to be readjusted. Um, and it follows on from the much bigger drop. Uh, that happened at the end of um, April. And that was largely driven by falls in power prices. Now, obviously, battery storage funds are trying to capture the fluctuations in power prices, um, buying cheap, selling high, uh, storing it in the meantime, and also the contracts that are available for National Grid to help stabilise the, the grid. Um, so falls in power prices have a sort of um, an effect on the absolute magnitude of swings in power prices, obviously. And so that was a fairly chunky impact to the um, first quarter NAV. That's probably not going to be repeated, and we may see that pick up again. Um, it's interesting, they, they've been talking about the fluctuations in power prices. There were <clears throat> some days over the summer where the wind was blowing, sun was shining, um, and we weren't using as much power as we normally would, and the prices went negative. Uh, I think three days it happened, um, which they can do in this kind of intraday market because basically we get some, way too much power, 
um, and the crew doesn't need it. So it kind of penalizes you for delivering it. Um, at those times, they can take the power into storage and then uh, on, on that kind of negative price, you're going to get, get paid to store it and then um, sell it again when the prices turn positive again. So it doesn't matter when that sort of thing's going on. As long as you've got that volatility, then they can still make money. Um, this is the portfolio um, as it stands now. Um, they've got two things which are about to come on stream here in Q3. They've also got this Rush Harm project, which was supposed to be on stream now, but has now been pushed back into uh, first quarter 2024. And this is a grid connection problem. Again, it's something else that we've been talking about for a while. Um, the national grid really needs to get its act together. And I think the government needs to step in and force them to do it. Um, there are massive delays in terms of bringing on new storage projects, new um, new energy projects, um, anything you, you kind of want done. And um, they're going to push back and back and back for, for years now. Um, and that needs to be sorted out soon. Um, this delay to rush home, it's not the end of the world. It's obviously going to take a couple of quarters income off, um, which is unhelpful, but um, there's not much they can do about that. Um, so the, the value, revaluations that we've seen uh, this quarter, they've had one more project come on stream, which is the Farnham. They're also getting closer to energizing the bumpers and lip red projects, and they've had some progress in other sites. And they've also secured some more um, revenue from the national grid thing. This is in advance of these things coming on stream. So they're basically, it's, it's uh, again, it's capacity market stuff, um, which is all quite useful. They have some, have some operational sites for that to uh, be effective, though. Um, one of the things that I'm quite keen for them to get on with is covering the dividend with, with revenue. And that all comes back down to when, when do these things become operational? So um, it's really only revenue positive this first uh, six months of the current accounting year, which is the uh, six months to the end of April. They've, they've got some positive income there. Um, but the annual dividend cost is over 18 million pounds. Um, so it, it does need to get, get going before they'll, they'll do that. I think though we're not maybe that far off so this is their sort of um, planned timetable for things coming on stream. Obviously, Rush Home has now been kicked into Q1. They've got 129 megawatts operational at the end of June, including final only just calm stream there. But if you add in the bumpers one and a little wraith, that's more than double that again. So the income is going to start um, accelerating away from, from where it was. So we, we so that 4.1 million that we saw there didn't have a full six months worth of income in it from all of these projects. But once these these kick in, so if we fast forward to about a year from now, I do think this um, cash flow picture is going to look a lot more healthy. Um, and then obviously there's there's more to come as we go through. So I do think Harmony's probably not too bad um, and the probably oversold. This one is a uh, truck point session housing. And obviously we know here that the, the discount is, is way wider, um, even though the, the the discuss we've seen in the new energy sector, um, but it has been narrowing a bit, um, really on the back of the Civitas bid. Um, so even though we had quite a big uplift in the NAV here, um, the share price has been sort of moving up and that discount has been closing, which is all encouraging, um, but didn't go the right way in the last couple of weeks. Um, what they've announced this morning is they've sold four properties for about 7.6 million pounds and they sold them a profit to what they paid for them which is obviously a uh, stick in the box but um a small discount to the energy book value now, i don't know if that reflects the transaction costs or not because they say they were sold more or less in the book value and under 3.6 percent to me is like a sort of bigger than more or less um but there we go um the net initial yield that they're selling these on, let's see my NOI, is 5.75%. And they were valuing the whole portfolio on a 5.46% net initial yield at the end of December. Um, that's obviously potentially worrying. So we need to look at what the impact of that. And I'm going to do that in a second. And they said this morning that the prices were used to pay down debt or fund share buybacks. Um, it's enough money to buy back about 3% of the company at the current uh, market cap. 
So um, it could be quite impactful, even for a relatively small disposal. They've been talking about selling property since um, the beginning of the year. They didn't mention about paying down debt last time around. So the question arose in my mind, why would you think about it now? Um, I don't think they need to do it. Um, the actual debt that they've got is fairly long term dated. Uh, so the first maturities they've got in 2028. And if you look here at the um, interest costs, these are all fixed. They're quite low. I mean, you'd never be able to re replace those at anything like those sorts of rates. So hanging on to that as long as possible is it's obviously going to be quite advantageous in terms of cash flow and everything else. So I don't think it's a good idea to be paying down debt at the moment unless you really need to. You would, might really need to if you were thought you might be breaching covenants. So the loan to value ratio at the end of December was 37.4%. Um, and they had about 71 million pounds of property that wasn't uh, encumbered by debt at all. So, so the rest of it is, is, is the loans are secured against um, individual properties. But they've got 71 million pounds for the property that isn't um, included in that, that they could take more debt out if they like, or, or they could inject into um, structures to, to bump up the asset cover. So, I think from that point of view, that doesn't look too bad. This is um, looking at their last um, annual accounts. And you can see here, we talk about that 5.46 net initial yield, which is basically the annualized rents divided by the um, property court value valuation. So let's say, worst case scenario, that goes up to 5.75%. What would that do? Well, the good news is that they're getting really chunky rental increases because they're, most of the rents that they've got are inflation linked. They've capped them at 7% um, voluntarily. They didn't have to do that, but they, they did volunteer to do that. So I've assumed they get the full 71% uplift. That takes that rent up from 38.6 million up to 41.3. And if you apply those two numbers to uh, the valuation, you actually get an NEV uplift. So what I'm saying is, you, even if this isn't 7%, you've got a, quite a lot of wiggle room here for no change in the NAV. And actually an, an awful lot of wiggle room before you start worrying about are the prices di diving downwards below to a you know, level where you have to worry about land to value covenants. I just don't think we're there. So I would say don't pay back debt, uh, debt focus on buying back stock. So that's um, all I had. And let's now hand over to um, Andrew Mahati. Uh, great, thank you very much, James. Interesting as always. Let me just uh, switch over to my screen and we'll talk about the movers over the month of August. Um, I was going to say it's going to be short and sweet from me, but actually it's rather more short and bitter because uh, it wasn't a great month. Uh, the, uh, the overall change in the investment trust index was, I think, minus 2.1%. And uh, we had some new worries emerging about deflation in China at the same time as we're still wrestling with our inflation in the Western economies. Uh, so plenty to think about. Um, but there were some risers. On top of the list is Hydrogen One Capital Growth, which I talked about last month, actually. And uh, sure enough, the NAV that was announced just after I spoke about them last time was quite reassuring for the market. Uh, actually, it was up slightly over the quarter. And that helped the shares to regather themselves and actually post a quite decent gain over the month. Those have been volatile all the way since IPO. And I think um, we'll likely see more volatility in those shares. Uh, also on the list a bit further down, we have a couple of um, corporate uh, action positions. So Edison Property Investment Company has made progress, we think, in selling its portfolio. So uh, the shares rallied there, and Atlantis Japan Growth Fund, which announced plans to merge with Nippon Active Value. Um, but I think there is a bit of a, a theme, actually a twin theme going on, which is that uh, it's a typical August in some respects where, where limited liquidity is ruling in the market, and we've seen movement at the the two exotic ends of the market, as I'd say. So in the blue here, we have the gains that we've seen across some of the growth capital names, which are clearly uh, on wide discounts and um, 
proving attractive to those seeking some capital gains. And then we also have in the red the gains from the very high yielding structured finance sector, uh, which I'll just speak about briefly. But those are obviously uh, from people seeking high yields. Um, so in the growth capital sector, this is quite interesting because I think um, if you're feeling positive, you can argue there are some small signs of a shift in sentiment. So, for example, we have seen in the media um, that they, they put their big stick away with, with which they keep beating Scottish mortgage. And um, and actually, there's been some more positive coverage about the unquoted holdings in the Scottish mortgage portfolio. And I think maybe that reflects a willingness now to look forward and to think about things actually getting better. Uh, but I think any recovery we have seen is still quite tentative. It's been spotty. So we have seen a couple of decent rises. So the hydrogen uh, Hydrogen One capital growth gain was, was significant, but they're still on a 43 discount. And we've seen Seraphim space actually rise very sharply from its lows. Uh, it did hit 26 pence in July and shares are 46 today. So that's a pretty significant bounce. Uh, but if you look at the discounts in the table, actually Seraphim space is still on a 50 discount. Uh, Chrysalis on 49, Shehalian Fund around 40. So the discounts are still extremely wide in the sector. It's far too early, actually, to read anything too much into these uh, share price rallies I think we saw in August. Um, I don't think there's been any real shift in uh, the appetite for taking on more risk at this point. Uh, we'll see how those go. Um and then we have these high yields in the structured finance sector, uh, which you know has attracted some buying, I think, in August. And if you look at the yields um, in in the table here, they they look very enticing. So, thirteen point seven on Blackstone Loan Financing, which is uh, due to wind down. Uh, one interesting point there is that it said it might take at least seven years. So um, you're going to need to be quite patient there or hope actually that some kind of deal is done to take that portfolio away in the meantime. Um, I think that is a more likely outcome. But you see the other high yields here, Chenavari Toro 16, Fairex Income 15, Marble Points 18. So these do look very enticing and you think, well, you also wonder what's wrong really at those rates. Um, and I think part of the explanation is that these trusts are really complex. I think even if you can um, engage in the kind of very deep forensic investigation of the portfolio that James does so well, uh, it's still quite tricky, actually, to figure out exactly what these trusts are investing in, because they're um, typically, you know, things like CLOs in the, in the Blackstone portfolio, uh, I think unless you have a good knowledge of those, you're potentially diving into areas which you're not going to understand. And as the old stock market adage has it, you know, don't buy things you can't understand. So uh, my feeling with these kind of trusts is that they really are best suited for very sophisticated investors who are prepared to do their own research. And um, for that reason, actually, I've tended to shy away from them when uh, making any recommendations for uh, retail investors, because uh, the scope for things to go suddenly wrong here without understanding what's what's gone on. Uh, still, that, that's been attracting some attention. My feeling is that at both of these ends of the market, uh, there are actually quite good reasons to be cautious as well as the reasons to be attracted by the wide discounts on the one hand and the high yields on the other. Fortunately, there's a way of reconciling those, which I'll come on to now. And actually, James has already touched on. But um, the, the falls over the months were uh, fairly scattered. Uh, no great surprise to see uh, JP Morgan China on the list, as there's more concerns about China. Uh, equally, uh, Baker Steel Resources Trust is not being helped by that because, of course, the resources sector is very closely correlated to what goes on in China. 
Uh, interestingly, I saw some JP Morgan research on that, on which sectors we needed to worry about if we felt that China was going to be problematic. Uh, mining was top of the list as the ones of the the ones to be worried about. Um, and actually bottom of the list, which had a negative correlation with uh, Chinese uh, stock market prices, was healthcare. So, um, you know, that's that's possibly quite a, a useful uh, bit of knowledge there if you're looking for a safe haven. Uh, anyway, I think the theme here uh, in terms of what was going down last month was that the renewables uh, infrastructure sector continued to be out of favour, as James said. Really, this is the ongoing reaction to the change in interest rates and the uh, increases in discount rates being used for these portfolios. So they're very much out of favour. Uh, and what is interesting is that if you are looking for a sector that combines the big discounts to NAV with high yields, uh, I think this is the one that stands out. You can get that from real estate as well. But actually, if you're looking for yields of 8% plus, it's infrastructure and renewable infrastructure that is the one to look at, in my opinion, at this point, because it's really sold off enormously. And um, right across the sector now, there are good opportunities. Uh, and I think this is a reasonable investment area for all kinds of investors. You know, I think it is possible to understand you can dig into it and see exactly what the moving parts are, and um, uh, you can explain why it's come down. So the result is that you do have this quite big list here. I mean, it's not that easy to digest that table. So I have put on a chart, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but there are quite a lot of discounts now available over 30% and yields over 9%. So my sense is that if you can lock in those yields now uh, and, and be patient, then uh, that's probably quite a decent thing to do because um, I think there's very good scope for those discounts to narrow back in over the next couple of years. And if you're sitting there being paid 9 or 10% to wait, um, uh, particularly if, if inflation does come back down again, as I think it will, um, then that's quite attractive. Clearly, it's not just about the numbers here. You do need to make qualitative judgments about these trusts and about the sustainability of those dividends. In some cases, you will get growth coming through because of the inflation linkage as well. Um, so if we put those on the chart, uh, you've got the discount uh, along the bottom here, which is stretching out wider and wider to the left and the yield growing up towards the top. So anything in the top left-hand corner is, uh, is, is offering a, a great combination of high yield and wide discount. So digital infrastructure nine, uh, or digital nine infrastructure, sorry, stands out. Uh, that was one I talked about last month. Um, and I think it's still attractive, even though the price has rallied somewhat. Um, you've got triple point energy transition there, TENT, uh, which is also an interesting combination. They had some uh, figures out this morning, uh, which did show actually a modest decline in the NAV. Uh, but uh, I think that was quite typical of what we're seeing across this sector, that although we are seeing values chipped away somewhat, um, actually the, the, there are no terrible declines that really justify these enormous discounts. Uh, so uh, my feeling is there's value there. Uh, GCP is on the chart here, which obviously... Uh, uh, James will talk about with Ed in a moment. A couple of other curiosities. You've got uh, US Solar here uh, offering more than a 9% yield on a 35 discount. Uh, that's, I mean, they're in the process of um, hopefully appointing Amber Infrastructure as new managers. And um, that's really elicited, uh, I mean, virtually no positive reaction whatsoever from the market. Um, but I think that could be quite good news. Uh, I mean, it does remain to be seen. We'll have to see what Amber can do with the portfolio. But they are, I think, quite high quality managers. And um, and I think the prospects there probably look far better than they have done for quite some time. So that's intriguing. And we have Gore Street Energy Storage and Harmony, which obviously James has just covered, uh, both on the list. Uh, I'm, I also have quite a soft spot, actually, for SDCL Energy Efficiency. SEIT down there at the bottom. Um, 
I think that's a more conservatively positioned trust, hence the slightly lower yield. But there's a great deal of value in this sector, in my opinion. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how it does play out with these uh, discounts, because uh, clearly these trusts would like to continue raising money, and they're they're an awfully long way from being able to do that at this uh, this time on these discounts. Uh, okay, I think that covers it for me, James. So um, I'll uh, hand back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Interesting as always. Uh, hopefully, we've now got the thing up, back up again. Um, yeah, but there's a question there. I, I just answered while you were talking about um, some of the platforms are restricting access to some of these things now. And um, I, I am quite opposed to that. And I, my advice to date has always been um, switch platforms rather than. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that's right. I can't. I can't see any reason why those are not suitable investments. Really, no, so, um, exactly. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. 